Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, just very quickly, we'll just quickly introduce uh, Sheikh Akram Nadwi. Some of you may not know him, but obviously most, for most people he doesn't need an introduction. Um, he was teaching, he graduated from Nadwat al-Ulama in India. He was also teaching there. Um, he also got his master's from there in uh, specializing in hadith. He also um, attained, obtained his BA in economics and a PhD in Arabic literature from Lucknow University. He then moved to the UK. He was for a number of years uh, working as a researcher at Oxford Center of Islamic Studies. As you know, he's a prolific writer, researcher. I think he's published over 40 books in Arabic, English, Urdu. His largest project being the uh, 43 volume set on the female narrators of Hadith. He's also working on a 15 or 18 volume uh, explanation of Sahih Muslim. And he continues to work and research full time in Oxford now. He's also the principal of As-Salam Institute, which um, has about 200 Halimiya students every year online mainly. So without any further ado, um, one of his specialities and areas that he's been teaching for the last few years is actually Quran and Quran Tafsir, <coughs> specializing in thematic commentary. So without any further ado, uh, I'd like to hand over to Sheikh Muhammad Akram Nabi. Dear Shuyukh, uh, and my respected brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, I'm very pleased to be here this evening to say some words uh, about the Quran. And uh, this masjid is actually the first place where I start teaching in English language, you know, since I think 2004 or 5, when I, before I used to mostly in, in Oxford. And uh, I taught here many, many years, Alhamdulillah, so people know me and uh, we have been also benefiting from our Shaykh uh, Abdul Qayyum, Alhamdulillah, and uh, many other people. So I'm very happy to be uh, to be back here, Alhamdulillah. And uh, when I heard from uh, Shaykh Shafi that he finished uh, Tafsir of Surah Al-Baqarah, I was very happy because this is one of the important surah of the Quran. And the companions used to take some of them ten years to learn the Surah Al-Baqarah. So Alhamdulillah, you people have completed this surah, and now you're going to start. Uh, new surah, Surah Ali Imran. I will say inshallah a few words uh, more generally about the Quran and then something about this surah, Surah Ali Imran inshallah. About the Quran, you know, one thing is uh, we have to understand how important the book is. Uh, you know, there are no book like the Quran. There are no book like the Quran. Whatever people write, the human being, you know, you could be Aristotle of your time, you could be Ibn Sina, Ibn, you could be Farabi. You could be as intellectual, as intelligent as possible. You know, you could be Metaimiya, you could be Imam Ghazali, but no one can write something like the Quran. There are no books similar to the Quran. You know, people could write many volumes on the fiqh. In the Hanafi Madhab, you have got so many volumes in the Hanafi, you know, in the fiqh, you know, hundreds of the volumes. Badar Sanaya, and then you have Mafsut of Saraksi, and you have Hedaya, and so many books. In every madhab, there are so many books. None of them can be like the Quran. They never can take the place of the Quran. It's impossible. It never can happen. So we have to have people could be clever, intelligent, you know, but never can write something similar to the Quran. It never can happen. So we have to understand how great the book is. What the Quran does, nobody can do. No book can do. That's what we need to understand. You know, people read many books. You can see really, the people want uh, to read Hayal Umiddin. They want to read Greek, uh, study Greek philosophy. They want to be scientists. Most time when people study these things, uh, the intention is not to learn something. Intention is what? To impress someone. So I study Messina, Farabi, Aristotle. I can have very sophisticated argument. Why? To impress people. That's what people do. They learn these things to want to impress people. The Quran never teaches to impress people. The Quranic way to teach people how they become good people. Quran teaches you how to obey Allah, how to become Allah's slave. Quran never teaches you how to make you master. Quran never promises you that when you learn this book, you get glory, power in the world. No. Quran only teaches you when you learn this book, 
you become followers of the prophet you follow the prophet you become slave of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you obey him but what you get is you get success in the hereafter in this what test will happen problem will happen but if you get a success in the hereafter the quranic teaching really is to make people followers of the prophet quran never promise that when you read the quran you become prophet no only one person when he read the quran he became prophet that prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he received the quran quran made him prophet after the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam whoever reads the quran they only can become followers of the prophet they never can become a prophet to never read quran for that purpose that you predict something you say what will happen in the future you become master no learn the quran how to follow a prophet that why the quran is full of the stories of the prophets and messengers when you read ibrahim alayhi salam quran teaches you think like ibrahim to study ibrahim then you think like him that he born in a family where the father worshiped idol he makes idols he asked ibrahim to worship these idols ibrahim said no oh my father tell me why you worship them they can't think they can't say anything they can't harm they can't benefit you want me to bow to them you know mind clever mind sharp thinking person same yusuf alayhi salam the story is told that you know whatever happened all the problem in the life i you know i'm still you know integrity you know still pious you know people cannot force him to leave the piety no you can put him in the prison but he's pious quran teaches you person like that you become like that in any environment in any condition people can take you take away you from your family they can put you in the prison they can make you slave in a palace they can harm you whatever they like but they cannot take away your mind from you your piety from you be like yusuf yusuf was able to protect himself in every condition quran wants to make you like yusuf to read the quran that what quran wants quran wants to make you strong and that what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has done that when the quran came he produced people like abu bakr siddiq umar al farooq uthman abu ubaida and abdullah ibn mas'ud abu huraira among the women khadija aisha um salama these are people quran produced people ask what is the miracle of the quran the miracle of the quran is that quran can produce people like these there no book on the face of the earth if which can produce people like that there no book if you read aristotle you never can become abu bakr siddiq if you read ibn sina you never can become abu bakr siddiq ibn sina himself was not like abu bakr siddiq he never aspired to be like that but when you read the quran quran can make you like that that was the quran that why the quran said from very beginning hudal lil muttaqin quran does not did not come to fulfill your desire to make you happy no quran came to make you good to guide you you know you want in the life to be happy something that can please you but quran said no quran did not come to please you quran does not did not come to fulfill your desire you want something quran did not come to fulfill what you want no quran has come to make you good how you become good obey your lord he knows how to make you good don't obey yourself quran has come to teach you don't obey yourself don't you obey your, your parent don't obey your society don't please them your parent want to become happy they say oh my son want to marry big wedding and you know feast and you know spending money and this and that to so become happy say no because it purpose is not to make you happy or myself happy the purpose to obey my lord if he did not allow me i'm not going to do this don't quran never teaches you to please yourself to please your family to please your parent to please the society quran teaches you only one thing to please your lord and then do everything else in order to please your lord nothing else that what huda means huda means to make you good not to make you happy happiness will come when you become good like if you get an admission in oxford you say i want to be happy and then you waste your time and then you go around you know money and eating drinking and girls and mixing all that i want to be happy you get some happiness but you fail but there somebody says no i want to control my desire i want to work hard i want to be a good student when you become good student you learn then you become happy the real happiness come
that what Quran promised. Quran wants to make you good in this life, and then when you die, then Allah is going to make you happy. That Quran said, then you get actually what you desire, what you want. La khafun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. Then Quran promises something which this world cannot do. This world cannot fulfill the desire of even one person. If you desire something, it cannot fulfill even desire of one person. It is not worth of anything. But in that hereafter, Quran said, when I will give the believers paradise, everyone will get huge paradise. When you see their huge kingdom, you know, nothing like, you know, there's nothing like that on, on the face of that. It's very tiny, nothing like that. So this is what we need to learn. Really. When you come to the Quran, the big thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen you, that you learn his book. So when you learn the book, sacrifice your desire. Think, really, I want to be good. I want to get Quran, guidance from the Quran. I want to be like prophets. And Quran says, And then follow them. Follow the prophets. Sacrifice your desire. Be like those people. So this is what you need to learn. Always think really. When there are two choices, you know, one makes you happy and one makes you good. Which you are going to choose? The one which makes you good. Not the one which makes you happy. When you follow the one which makes you happy, it will harm you. You got to come to your restaurant. You have got so many restaurants around in East London, al and this and that, so many. When you come there, what happens? You choose the food which makes you happy. Then what happens? You get all the problem. You know, fat and diseases and you know, all those things. If you choose the food which can make you good, it's a different thing. Then you be healthy, you eat less. How the Prophet has been? In every single thing, when you do what it makes you good, it's always good for you. But when you follow the path of being happy, it always harms you. That Quran always has been thing. Follow the path which can make you good, not the path which can make you happy. So you can see the all Asian people came to this country, you know, they make money, that's fine, that, you know, can help family. But they did not leave their food. The food could be very good for Bangladesh, for India, in you know, a hot country, they bought. And in our country, we used to have biryani once a year. Now every day biryani. So tell me, and also people used to sweat there, work hard. So it was, you know, work one, one, one biryani once a year, it's fine. But if you keep eating every day, what will happen? All the problems. Problems will happen because you want to make yourself happy. You don't want to make yourself good. Quranic way is make yourself good. Not to make you disagree. That's what you need to. When people teach the Shaykh Shafi teach you Quran, think really what he teaches you. Is it going to help you to make you good or is it going to make you happy? Any path that makes you happy, don't follow that. The Quran says oppose that. You know, be away from that. That you know, leave your desire. Don't follow that. When you have two choices, one is desire, desire of verse 10 will be wrong. Leave that. Follow the path. That's good. So this actually, when you learn the Quran, this, keep this in the mind all the time. That why, you know, Quranic way is difficult. Because it's against the desire. All the time. People don't like that. So there are people who think of Quran, what Quran is good, but let's put something which can make it sweet, nice. Like, you know, when the children don't like medicine, so they make, you know, something sweet or something, so they can eat it. So then Sufi come and these people come and that people come and they say, no, no, we can create a mood to make you pious. So some dancing, some music, some sama, you know, something together in congregation and people do this and then they become good. You know, people enjoy that. To become good, that's the next stage. It never, sometimes never comes. Quran never does like that. So Quran never wastes your time. Quran says, no, think. If it is good, then do it. Don't wait for the mood. Whether you have mood or don't have mood, don't worry. Just do it. So that's why, you know, if you have habit to listen to the preachers, to the wives, people who give sermons, it's going to harm you. Because all preachers, they're only thinking it, how to make people in a mood, how to make them happy, how they make them to listen to them. So they teach you those things, necessarily not, they're not, not right. That's why all the fabricated hadith, all the munkar weak, they came in Islam through preachers. Because they want to make, to make you happy. They are not responsible people. When you come to the Quran, you don't have those things. To come a preacher, he will say, if you read this verse, you know, you get so much reward. 
But you never see something like that in the Quran. Quran never say you get this reward. Whenever you read the Quran, you never find all those things. What preachers have been saying, Quranic way they different. Quran really does not want to do anything like that. Quran wants to make you think, put pressure in your mind. Think book of the thinking, not book of mood. Quran does not create a mood. Don't do things because you have a mood. Do things because it is good. It makes you to think. Book of the thinking, that is the Quran said, this is the book full of the blessings. For think about it, then contemplate, then go deeper, make the understanding of the book. So, you know, people that have been in India, Maulana Hamiduddin Farahi, Rahmullah Ta'ala, he was a very clever man, expert of Arabic language and literature, uh, you know, one of the uh, great uh, Arab uh, writer and liter- man of literature, uh, Sheikh Taqiyuddin Hilali, Marakashi. He went to India and met all the ulama there. He said, since I came to India and I met all the ulama, I never have seen any alim in India who is as eloquent in Arabic language as the Mawla Farahi. And then his English was very good. You know, English and Farajian, he learned Hebrew and all those things. He said he spent 30 years in the Quran. Just 30 years in the Quran, nothing else. If you get the Quran really, everything, nothing. You know, 30 years, if you understand the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, much better. If you understand one verse of the Quran, that is much more precious than Holy universe. You know, even one name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more precious. Think really, not waste of time. You can could think, if I spend one hour reading the Quran, in that time somebody can make so much money. Don't worry, what you are making, much more than the money. You know, it reminds me of the, one of the great uh, poet of Persian language, Khaqan, rahimahullah ta'ala, 5th century. Very, very deep poetry. So he said, Pasasi sal imana muhakkak shud bakhaqani ki yakadam ba khuda budan bi az mulke sulaymani. After 30 years, this meaning has become very clear to Khaqani, to my mind. That one moment with Allah is better than the whole kingdom of Sulaiman Ali Salam. Sulaiman's kingdom is the biggest kingdom. So much power. But one moment with Allah. One Subhanallah, one Alhamdulillah is much bigger than the kingdom of Sulaiman Alayhi Salaam. Because you know, Al Hadith says, one Subhanallah fills all the space between the earth and the heaven. All that thing. That I think, don't worry. It could be possible that when you spend time in the Quran, you can't make much more money. But your value in Ayah of Allah will grow. And if the master of the universe likes you, don't worry then about anything else. He loves you. He likes you. It is good really that you know once a week you come here and learn about the Quran. And no time in the Quran wasted. No time. Before you leave the, the place and just announce that your sins are forgiven. No time is wasted. You know, you come here, you become pure. And then you learn those things which can make you good people, pious people, can make you eligible to enter into paradise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he gives you paradise. So this general advice keep always in mind that this book not necessarily going to make you rich. It's not going to make you Babar or Kankar of India or Mughal Emperor, nothing. This book is not going to give you glory in this world necessarily, but what this book can give you the glory in hereafter. It can make you, help you to please your Lord. And the glory of hereafter is much, much better than any glory on the face of the earth. That, this promise for everybody. Glory in the world, not for everybody. But when you come to the Quran, what Quran gives you, everybody, every single person, everybody comes to, because Allah's Allah's kingdom is huge. Everybody gets this thing. So this always keep in mind. Now I'm coming about Surah Al Imran and just summarize in a few things that we need to learn. So Alhamdulillah, you have learned Surah Al Baqarah and Surah Al Al Imran and Hadith in Sahih Muslim, which calls both of them Al Zahra Wain. So these are two very important surahs, really. They're shining uh, surahs and they have contained so much information, so much guidance from beginning and both complete each other. So, you know, some things are mentioned in Surah Al Baqarah in detail but they are mentioned in Surah Al-Imran in less detail. Some things are in less detail in Surah Al-Baqarah, but they are in more detail in Surah Al-Imran. But and is this a deen, as you know, is two parts, Iman and Islam. That's what deen is. The whole deen is two parts, Iman and Islam. Actually, that's how the life of the people is. What Iman means, that you think, you understand, 
and then put your trust in. Like I want to buy a computer, so I go there, think and you know, but this, then understand it, and then I put in my trust. So this is the right machine to buy for me. Or you want to marry someone, to find out about the, your you know a girl, and um, understand her properly, and then you put your trust. Oh, this is the right person to marry. Or if a woman wants to marry this person, so this is called iman. The iman is always with the mind thinking that you think, understand. And then put your trust. That iman, iman means to put your trust. So you think about Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. You understand Him, and then you put your trust in Him. That He is my Lord. You understand Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That He is honest person, true person, never lies, never cheats. Then you put your trust in Him. That He is my messenger. I will obey Him. I'll follow Him. You learn the Quran. This is the book. Never uh, uh, teaches something wrong. It always something true and something which helpful to me. Never cheats me. Then I put my trust in, in the Quran. That is the iman. The iman is with the mind. That you understand, you think, and then you put your trust in that thing. That iman. Allah is right. That is Surah Al-Baqarah. Surah Al-Baqarah basically has come to create iman. Iman in the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Iman with Rasul. That you press, put your trust in the Messenger. That is right Messenger. The book that he has been given. That is the right book of the guy. That is your book. So your iman becomes very strong. That you know this is the right book. The way of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is: once you put your trust, then you must surrender. So you chose the right wife. This is the right woman I want to marry. I understood her. I studied about her, and now I'm happy. This is the right person. Then what will happen? Then you have to surrender. You have to provide accommodation, expense. Now there is a no excuse. After you marry her, then you have to do all that. Now you can't say, oh, "Let me think." No thinking finished. Thinking was before marriage, but once you married, there no thinking. Now you have to do your duty, submission properly, surrender to your duties. Same with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. First understand, think, but once you put your trust, iman, then full submission. Like Ibrahim Al Islam, before you know iman, thinking, understanding, you know analyzing everything properly, questioning, you know with the mind, in a good mind. But once he puts his trust in Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, then full submission. Then his Lord asks him, "O oh Ibrahim, slaughter your son, sacrifice him, his slaughter him." He did not question, "Oh my Lord, you the creator of the life. How can you take away the life? You gave me the son after such a long wait. You listen to me. How can you ask me to to slaughter him? Did he ask any question? Ibrahim comes in the morning to his son Ismail." And he said, "Oh my son, ya bunaya, inni ara fil manami anni adbahuka. Oh my beloved son, I have seen in dream that I am slaughtering you. Fan zur maada tara. What do you think? It's not that he smiles and no, no, don't slaughter me. He's not going to slaughter him. He's going to slaughter him anyway. Why he says to think? He wants him also have to save mind. He wants his whole family to be in full submission. The brother Ismail says, 'Ya abati fal ma tu umar. Oh my father, what you have been can't do it.'" I am from your family. I am not different from you. That what we learn that you know submission. You know if I am a tumor, you will find me. I am the patient. You think that I will be scared? No, I will surrender properly. And then the Quran says, "Falama aslama," when the father and son both surrendered. That what Quran is teaching really. That is surrendered to him. Allah is never going to harm you, but He is going to test you. It will happen really. Sometimes you have big. Hope of a prophet again. Allah will say, "No, don't do this." So you're going to lose, but you're going to gain really. So Allah's commands are always a test, but they always at the end of the day they are good for you. That how test. So full submission. Whether you understand, you don't understand. If it is, if Allah says, then it must be right. Like Abu Kasr said, "Dikat Allah Taala." You know, Hudaybiya. When the Prophet said that made a treaty, then. Omar Khattab Allah Taala who has question, you know, and he wants to understand that a good way of the believer, but there was somebody more believer than him. Abu Kasr Siddiq. He understood before that. He came to Abu Kasr Siddiq and said, "You see, how can we accept a treaty which is weakness?" So he said, "Don't you know that he is the messenger of Allah? He is the messenger of Allah. If he says that must be right, this really is what Abu Kasr Siddiq's position is. Is that you know always make like if Allah commands." That must be right. You know, whatever happens, if Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "Don't drink wine," then that must be right. 
then all the people who drink wine, if they become the best people, more civilized, and they rule the world, still you have to believe they are wrong. And those who don't drink, they are the best people. Those surrender to, it could happen, that you see with your eyes something different, but surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is full submission to Allah. That is the surah to Ali Imran. Surah Ali Imran is the surah of submission. That is surah where the Quran says, Inna deena inda Allah islam the path of the obedience is full submission to Allah SWT. That why Quran actually never teaches Islam with capital I. Islam always in the Quran is with small I. Capital I Islam is identity. There are so many million Muslims in the world. I got Islam. No. Islam means submission. Full obedience to Allah SWT. If Adhan is said and you don't pray, it's not Islam. Islam is when Adhan is said, you surrender and you pray. When a month of Ramadan comes, Islam is not that you don't fast. Islam is to fast. When a hajj becomes obligatory, then you go for the hajj. You know, when you have choice between truth and lie, you speak the truth. When you have choice between cheating and not cheating, don't cheat. Full submission to Allah, that what he wants. And he will keep testing. He says, we'll test you. We are not going to leave you like that. Just you say, I'm Muslim, is enough. You will be tested. Your Islam will be tested. So That's why the Quran mentioned really in their surah, the stories of the people who had full submission. Amazing people. They used to raise everybody's submission. The Quran said in other surah, surah, surah Al-Anbiya, that these are the people they used to raise everybody, compete everybody, like, not like our time. We want to, want to compete to have better car. You know, somebody in my neighborhood got a car, I want to have a car better than him. You know, so that's what we're competing. People compete in, in this matter, better house, more houses. But the people who Quran mentioned, Zakaria alayhi salam, Maryam alayhi salam, Yahya alayhi salam, Quran said, they actually have, they are in a time much worse than our time. Many people think in England that we are living in a Muslim country, how can we be good? We need to do hijrah to a Muslim country, then we become good. Though I, I know in Oxford really, so I have some friends. They, say, they left Oxford. They said, no, it is a non-Muslim country. We want to go to Pakistan, a Muslim country, and become pious. And then I saw them back after five years. So I said, what happened? He said, they said no, this country is better than Pakistan. After that, they, they came back. You know, think really that, you know, what, the, what you, Allah wants from you, it does not depend on Pakistan. You can become the most pious person without Pakistan. You can become the most pious person in a prison, in a well in a cave, living in a cave, and you come the nearest person to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, that what Quran, you see, when these prophets, Quran had so much praise for them, Zakaria, Yahya, Isa, Maryam, all mentioned in Anbiya, and also in Surah Maryam, and they mentioned in this Surah Al-Imran. Did they have Khilafah? Did they have any state? They're under the Roman Empire. Romans are ruling them. According to Sharia? No. The law of Roman was not Sharia. They had their own law. In Jerusalem, the rule is rule of these people. Still, the Quran has full praise for these people. The Quran, Quran loves these people. And the Qariya is you know, so near to Allah that when he comes in the prayer, that you know, he talks to Allah in the prayer, you know, it's so near that while he's still in the prayer, Allah talks to him. And angels come and start talking to him. That is, these are the people really. And the Quran mentioned Maryam al Islam. That you know, Quran said to Maryam al Islam, Ya Maryam, uqnutil rabbike, wasjudi, warka'i, ma'arraka'in. Then the Quran teach Maryam al Islam, O Maryam, leave your house, go for a protest, and march, and big revolution, then I'll be happy with you. Nothing. Very simple advice. Uqnutil rabbike, O Maryam, be humble. You know, bow to your Lord with fear. When you stand the prayer, bow to me with fear. Work was judi and do sajda to me. Work ai mar and do ruku with other people. They are ruled by, by non-Muslims, these prophets. They are ruled by non-Muslims. Still, Quran loves these people. Actually, Quran commands this, us to follow them. Fabe huda follow those people. You think really what Quran wants to give. We want something small. You know, I, this reminds me about Ibn Taymiyyah Rahmullah Ta'ala because, you know, he was so important and good teacher and famous. 
and so many students around him. So somebody complained to the ruler of Syria that this man wants to take over the kingdom from you because he has so power and now so many people. So kings don't like that. You know, they can like anything, but they don't want anybody to share the power and take the power. So he called uh, in Bethany and said that it has come to our knowledge that you want to rebel and take the kingdom from us. So in Bethany I said, your kingdom, your kingdom and the kingdom of all the Mongols, Mongols were the most powerful at that time, is not equal to me. La tosavi fal san, even one penny. It's not equal to one penny. You think I want this kingdom from you? Ibn Taymiyyah Rahmullah used to sit after Fajr prayer in his place in the mosque and do dhikr until the uh, uh, sun has risen very high. And then he used to say, Hadhi ghadwati. This is my morning food. If I don't take this one, I cannot survive. This is my Jannah. This is my paradise. You know, the people who live in, the, people who make Allah happy, you know, what they feel really, you can imagine. The taste that they get, they, you can't get that taste in a food, in a kingdom. You can rule the world, but the taste that they get when they say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, when they do sajda to Allah, the ladda that they get, the enjoyment that they get, you never can get. You know, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the way he used to do sajda, and then he used to say, Ju'alat qurratu ayni fi salah. You know, the prayer was his, his comfort. What they get for the, for the prayer, you can't get anywhere. When they stand in front of their Lord in the prayer, it's like mi'raj for them. They can't, you know, this is something they, ca they cannot give away. Nothing. This is, you know, need to understand really. That's what Surah Al-Imran is. After you have got Iman, Iman in the Messenger, Iman in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Iman in the book. Now Quran says, they surrender. They listen to me. That's what happened. In this Surah, you can, later on comes uh, Battle of Uhud. Full submission. In Badr, you won the battle. Now in Uhud, 70 people have been killed. The Prophet has been injured. So much problems. But Quran said, no, still you need to surrender to me. In, in all difficulties, listen to me. Don't disobey me. Listen to me. In all the injuries. And then the Prophet commanded the, uh, his followers, let's follow unbelievers. There are hurt people, injured. 70 people have been killed. Still they have to follow unbelievers. Command, command has come. That what is this surah said, that you know, in the Quran said, if you have pain, they have pain. What are you, may Allah, ma la yarjoon. You expect what they don't expect from Allah. You have hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this full submission, that what you know, don't have Islam with capital I. Islam with capital I does not do any, any good, nothing. It actually can make you a hypocrite, you can make you a munafiq. Islam with capital I can make you a munafiq. All these munafiq in Medina, they used to have Islam with capital I. In the rest they are Muslim. Is Allah wants from you Islam with small I. That you know. Some, some mission. Surrender. That how you need to or train yourself. Nobody is there. No dancing, no music, no sama, no Sufi gathering. Still you obey your Lord. That Allah, Allah wants that you, you think with your mind, not with your mood. Keep it. People come, you know, like the, oh, in Ramadan, let's do nafra together. You know, long prayer to Jama. So I said, why you want to do Jama? Why can't you pray alone? Then when they're in group, you know, it's better and we... Because what happened when gathering happens, you enjoy that. But if you pray at home, alone, it's much better. But people don't do this. Why? Because they enjoy it. They want some enjoyment. It is taste really. Obedience of Allah SWT, if you do alone, that was the real one. That's that why the Prophet said, and the hadith actually has come in the context of uh, Tarawi in, uh, in, in Sahih Bukhari. In that, the context. in that hadith, the Prophet said, all the prayers at home are better, illa la maktuba, except the fard one. Because when you pray at home, alone, that is between you and your Lord. You don't please anybody, don't show off, don't enjoy anything. Why for the prayer in the masjid? For another reason, for another purpose. So this, you know, submission. That you alone, nobody sees you. You fear Allah. That is, this is what this surah is going to develop, inshallah, in the light of the story, the Prophet the Messenger. I don't want to take so much time uh, from you. Uh, the surah will be taught, inshallah, by Sheikh Shafi. Uh, you know, he just asked me that, you know, say something, though I don't think really there was any need to say. But uh, anyway, sometimes people listen to somebody else. It's a good reminder, inshallah. Yeah, so the question is that I said, uh, that Quran is not a book to create a mood. 
uh, you know, like many people do. So the brother has asked, there are verses in the Quran which actually looks like, you know, creating the mood that when people read the Quran, tears come from their eyes and this and that. You know, we are not against tears coming from the eye, fear of Allah, love of Allah. That should happen. What I'm trying to say is, the Quran address the mind. You do things because you understand and do it. Then after that, certainly you get fear of Allah, you get all those things. What creating of the mood do, you don't understand. You do because everybody does. It. You do it because there is an environment like that. Because they have made, you know, sometimes what they do, they you know, make nice perfume, turn off all the light, and they create certain atmosphere. Then everybody starts dancing and this and that. Quran does not do like that. Quran addresses the mind. When you listen to the Quran, understand the Quran, yeah, fear will come. If fear will come, you know, your tears will come from your eye. The Prophet used to have, that is the real one. That is not because of the room, mood, because of understanding. When you understand the Quran, I'm trying to say Quran is not a book to cheat you. What other people do, they know really nobody going to understand them, to create a mood, so they listen to you. Quran does not want to deceive you. No, understand, think. Then after that, impact will come. It is book of thinking. If anything happened to you without thinking, it is false. But you understand it, then something happened, that's a real one. That's what remains, that's what Quran does. Quran addresses the mind. So tears come in the eye of the people who read the Quran, and when they pray, especially the prayer, but it comes because they understand it. You know, they, they know what they're doing. Yeah, you know, this is a very good question, really, that how to understand the Quran. The first thing, let me make very clearly, when the Quran is revealed, to Allah's intention never has been that I reveal the Quran and you write tafsir. That's not the purpose. That in my book needs a th- your tafsir. The Prophet never wrote any tafsir. The Prophet actually never said anything. You know, yesterday when the Quran is revealed, he is going to read in the haram, when the prayer and the Arabs listen, and they, believe, they understand what. Quran really is a, in a book of the people, people's book. It is not in any specialized language. Like when I write a book of the fiqh, so you need to know certain terminology before you can understand my book. Quran is a book of the people. It is in people's language. If you know people, if you live with the people, you can understand this book. But the problem is people don't want to use their mind. The simplest process for this really is a very easy one. Quran was revealed to Arab people in that time, in particular time. What you need to do really is you need to do this exercise. Force yourself back to that environment. You know, think. And think really when they read this verse, how they understand. Like, you know, somebody will come to you and say, this verse in the Quran has this scientific theory, theory of the science. This Quran means, means this verse means the earth is moving. Then question really, but uh, people who read this Quran in campaign, they never understood like that. They never uh, made any claim that we are scientists now because the Quran has made us scientists. Then I think, so think really what they understood from that verse. The first effort always make like that. That when the Quran revealed to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, how did he understand? And what he did after that, when the Quran revealed, what, did, what practice he did, what his companions did. When the Quran was revealed, what Rebu Hunna, strike your wives, so what the Prophet did, did he make, gave a stick to everybody, go and hit your wives? Did he start doing something like that? Actually his wives say, he, the Prophet never hit any woman. Madalaba. So whenever you read the Quran, always ask this question, that when the Prophet learned this, how did he understand? And what he did, the first exercise. First thing you do, that you know, understand how the Prophet applied the Quran. That we call first application. Then after I think, now my time has changed. The space has changed, not in the same time. Same Quran the, which was applied by the Prophet in this way, how I can apply in my time. So slightly, sometime adjustment will be there. Something here and there you can change a little bit. You can, he used to travel by camel, you can travel by aeroplane or something. You can have some adjustment. You do this way. But never think the Quran has been revealed to you. Never think like this is a big mistake. Quran never has been revealed to anybody other than the Prophet Muhammad. He's the only person. Only person who received the Quran, the Prophet Muhammad. Everybody else got the Quran through him. The poets can say, like Iqbal said, that you never can understand the Quran unless it is revealed to you. It is poetry. Truth is that the Quran never can be revealed to you. The truth is Quran only has been revealed to one person. Quran is a historical fact, it is not a poetry. It is a book of the history. It is history, it came to one person. He is the one who heard from Angel Jibril. We did not hear anything. 
Abu Bakr Siddiq did not hear the Quran from any Jibreel. Umar did not hear. Only one person heard the Quran. And that is the Prophet Muhammad After him, everybody got the Quran through him. You could be Abu Bakr Siddiq. You could be Aisha. You could be lying next to the Prophet when the Quran is revealed. But you don't listen what Angel Jibreel said. You listen what Muhammad said. His wives never regard Quran from Angel Jibreel. They got from Prophet Muhammad Always force yourself to him. That how this man received the Quran. Because he's chosen a man. Nobody can know the Quran better than the Prophet. Nobody can practice the Quran better than the Prophet. Because he's chosen a man. What he did, Allah has chosen him. That the first thing this. Second thing, then try to apply to yourself. So I say Quran has two applications. One application of the Prophet, how applied by the Prophet. Second is your application. But you cannot apply to your life unless you know how he applied. That's why you need to learn Sunnah. Books of Hadith, how the Prophet, what his society was. If you do these two exercises, it is, inshallah, it will help you. But it will take time in the beginning, but that's how you need to do. Most people, what they do, like a professor in Oxford sitting, oh, this is my book. I don't know really whether who is Muhammad. This is my book. I want to understand it. You will fail. This is not your book. You cannot work like a professor. You need to force yourself back to the history, in the history. Go back to the person whose book this is, who received it. Understand what he understood, then apply to yourself. You know, very often people think that if we don't know Arabic, so how can we mention? Actually, the thing is, the, the, what Quran teaches you, it is not confined to Arabic language. Most 90% teaching, you translate any language, it will be easy for you to understand. When Quran fear Allah, the day of judgment, you know, paradise, hellfire, establish the prayer, fasting, taqwa, piety, fear of Allah, all of these things actually are, whenever they're translated by an expert, by a good translator, it will be the same thing you can understand, you can think really. There are some things for Arabic language that could happen. This is another matter, translation. But still you need to go back to Sunnah of the Prophet. You read in English language, but try to understand, okay, Quran says this thing that you know establish aqimus salata. Let me see really how the Prophet did establish the prayer. What did he do? The person who received the Quran, how did he do? When he was traveling, how did he manage? Because traveling, you don't have easiness to have access to the mosque. Did he pray in the mosque when he was traveling? You know, how did he do? I mean, if he did not have time uh, for wudu, what did he do? To so think really, all the time make effort. It doesn't matter really whether you read Quran in Arabic language, or Persian, English, Urdu, Bengali, any language. You need to go by, meaning it, you cannot have Quran without the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Or another way you can say, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not a postman. He delivered to your house, now you don't care about it. Like, no, you receive letter in the morning in Europe, and then you don't worry about, about the postman. You understand? You don't ask him what it, mean, it means. And he will say, I'm just a postman, I don't know anything anyway. It is your letter. Was Prophet Muhammad a postman? He was not a postman. He was a messenger, everybody, no understanding of the Quran is authentic without his understanding. You need to go back and learn from him. That's why Sunnah is important. That the Quran keeps saying, obey the Prophet, follow the Prophet. Without the Sunnah, there is no Quran. Quran never can be understood. You need to connect both. Both are together. Anybody who made a distinction between the Quran and Sunnah, they are misguided people. They never can be guided. Because you know, he's the one who Allah has chosen him. And Allah asked him to teach. Quran says, when Adhan for the Friday prayer is given, do this. But Quran never teaches us what Friday prayer means. Quran never says what Adhan means. Quran never says what Nida means, what Juma means. Quran never says. Quran never says how many raka in the prayer. Quran never says like that. But Quran says that when you have fear, you follow the Prophet, half of the army pray the half of the prayer and then the rest of them. Quran has all the details, but how to pray? Quran never teaches you. Hajj, if you don't have the Prophet Muhammad, you cannot perform Hajj. What the details? To try to understand really that what we need, it doesn't matter whether you read the Quran in Arabic language, Persian language, Urdu, English, any language, but you need to know what the Prophet has done. Without the Prophet, the Quran does not will guide you. It will not, it will actually sometimes misguide you. The Quran has come in human, for human mind. People who think, Quran has come for the people, whether they are Arabs or non-Arabs, for any time they can understand, think. But still you need a messenger. It's still really how to be a good believer, you need a messenger. You know, it's not that, you know, be have taqwa and fear. I understand something, 
but details of taqwa is still you need to know from the prophet how he did taqwa with the wife because what you go to extreme you know for example if you read a hayalum din next day you'll be in a desert or forest in a cave because you think oh this book teaches you to if you read the quran sometime and the quran criticizes the worldly life and this life and that life do you think the best thing is really to be in a cave then the, you can follow the quran but you can more pious person but you think the person who received the quran he never went to he he received the quran in the cave but after that he never went to the cave he, after that he never went he wanted to do it in the society with the, with the, with the real people so that what if it is possible it's true you can understand taqwa piety fear of allah love allah iman you know no doubt it's a human language and and human sense your fitra it will teach you is still there could be some ambiguity it still could be something which i think a concept will not be it's still you need to adjust like for example you buy the bricks you know from the from anywhere and you want to build house you can't you can't use the brick as it is sometimes you need to adjust some you need to cut cut the corner so quran is helpful but you need to how the prophet adjusted himself how he adjusted around that adjust that is sunnah sunnah is the adjustment so not only in in law even in the iman submission taqwa piety sometimes you think it's, this is not piety like you know the three people came to the house of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the prophet was not there so they asked his wife you know how he is in the night they said sometimes he prays sometimes he sleeps in the night they say you know uh, uh uh you know how is uh, fasting to his they say you know he fast sometimes does not fast something to so that say you know he the prophet you know he the different eyes for one of the eyes for me i will always fast never break one of the i will always pray all the night one of the say i will never go to marry have a wife and they left then the prophet some came and uh, you know people said to him what happened he called all three and said you said this i am the one who knows more than you ana alamuk billah wa akhshaakum lillah I, you know, I sleep in the night and I pray in the night. I fast and sometimes I don't fast and I marry. And those who leave my sunnah, they are not from from me. So even in the piety, fear of Allah, sometimes you can be an extreme. So that's why the Prophet used to say to even his companion who actually are under him, supervised by him, still they have become an extreme. So he used to call them qaribu, saddedu, wa qaribu. Be right and be in middle, you know, don't be an extreme. He used to call them. Some of them, you know, wanted to be another extreme he said no he always want to keep them in the middle so you know if you run piety from the quran without the prophet sometime could be possible you go on extreme the prophet's life you know all the people need example you know like you know there are so many doctors sitting here tell ask them can i become doctor by reading a book could be there good best book is still you need help actually even actually a small thing you know london and underground map is very very good map really most people find very helpful very easy the first person somebody comes to my village in india who never has seen an underground and give him the map will be easy for him he needs somebody to help him he will not be confident is still quran is the best book is still you need someone to help you especially when you have desire people have got this desire always gives you away so we cannot have a life without the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam but yes yeah, certainly you don't necessarily need to be a good arabic language is accept when the meaning is problem you say it means uh, this and somebody says this then we have to refer someone who know the arabic you know there are uh, certainly there are very verses in the quran that uh, you have to understand it but i'm telling so that they, these verses are always connected to something else where you need a prophet so you can't just start, you know you, you don't need to ask a prophet every single thing he never taught every single thing he, he just gave the verse to you and you understand but uh, you, your life needs to be guided by messenger that i'm trying to say it doesn't mean that every single detail like for example a father said to his sons his children in the house i want you people to be good that i said the good is a word understood by everybody but details of good will differ and sometimes he'll say no no this is not good you know he will he'll sometimes say you need to learn from him what good means though you know really what good generally you know what good means but sometimes probably to generally you know what means ibadah what taqwa means but you need a or with especially when you know really this world is full of the misguidance so let me be safe don't you want to be safe everybody want to be safe safest way to go back to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because it could be possible that my understanding because of my desire you know nobody says that for every single verse you need a sunnah nobody says really but in your life in order to apply the quran you need sunnah the quran to be applied in your life you need sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam 
So if you think verses uh, which are self-explanatory, if you follow them and you start, you will see problem. Sometimes, oh, this, oh, let me follow. You will see the problems will be there. So there are no doubt you get certain ideas, thoughts there, piety, fear of Allah. But in practice, sometimes they can lead to extreme. Not all of ourselves, but sometimes could happen. When you have prophet around you, then you know how to be high balance. That's what the, Quran, you know, the prophet does. But I never mean really that for every single verse you need to go back to Sunnah. You don't have really. The prophet never explained every single verse. So like paradise, hellfire, yeah, no, try to understand. Generally, you know how you to be fear in hellfire, how you to ask for paradise. We no need to know about details from because you don't have so many sunnah about that matter. You're, but you need someone around you as a whole, really, not for every like a father. Father doesn't, you know, you learn language from your mother. Did she teach you every sentence that you got to use forever? No, some sentences. Then your mind makes from that, develops further from that. So what we mean really is when you have prophet in your mind, I study him, so your frame is done, your, there is a frame. Then after that, you have so much freedom. You think it is, still you will be within that circle. You cannot leave that. So we don't say that for every single thing, you can't trust your mind. Allah made mind. You have to trust in it. Mind. Your mind, trust it. But get a frame from the Prophet. So that will give you the circle, the limit. Don't go beyond the limit.